Koi K300 has become known as one of the world's most dependable and respected upright pianos, and also amongst its best selling. In markets such as Australia, I know the UK, and also by some indications Canada, it's the best selling upright. And in what I suspect was probably an inevitable response to that momentum by Yamaha, the U1 now costs a typical dealer less to buy than a K300, according to pianobuyer.com. So in light of its sustained popularity, we are circling back to this 48 inch Japanese made piano and answering the internet's six most often asked questions about this model. Now, before we dive into questions, let's just play and quickly reacquaint ourselves with the K300 and what the musical experience of this instrument is really actually like. So the K300 to me is a really great embodiment of what Kawhi considers to be their sound. It's a warm sound, it's a colorful sound. What do we mean by colorful? I mean these labels always get thrown around and it's kind of like listening to wine tasters talking. It's like, do they actually mean that? Does it mean anything? Well, when I say complex, this is what I hear. It means that I'm hearing the, the note itself, which we sometimes refer to as the fundamental. It's like the pure version of like the note that you're playing. And then if you've got color or complexity, uh, it essentially means you're referring to lots of other partials or lots of other um, elements or, or secondary tones that you're hearing um, as a part of that note. Because of course a piano note isn't just the fundamental, it's always a series of overtones. So the more colorful piano and th the more overtones are, are evident, uh, and possibly other resonances, um, desirable resonances, are happening uh, throughout the piano. So it's this rich, colorful experience. And that's what I get a lot of when I play most kawais, I would say. It tends to be a very colorful experience. And uh, if you're thinking of this kind of on a stereo EQ, you might like tip it a little bit towards the warm versus the, the bright. Uh, there's just this nice softness and roundness uh, to the notes. Let's now dive into some of the most common questions that we found both on the internet as well as speaking to customers here. Number one, where is the K300 made? Well, for North American markets, the K300 is made in Japan. The Made in Japan sticker is easy to see, it's pretty unambiguous, and I've actually had a chance to be to the Kawai factory now three times to watch these instruments come together. They also produce K300s in Indonesia for some other markets, but I know many companies have trouble sometimes making sure that there's clarity out there. So as far as I can you know, help with that clarity, if you're buying a K300 in North America, it is made in Japan. 
period. Question number two, what year did the K300 come out? The K300 came out in 2013, but what customers may not know is that there have been some evolutionary differences and developments between a K300 today versus one of the originals. By and large, the scale design has remained the same, but the base strings seem to have received a few improvements and the action rest rail now has the microcell absorber strip to improve repetition speed even more than it already was. Um, generally, I like the fact that we're now 10 years in with no signs of Kawhi moving from this model. Um, the stability and the consolidation of Kawhi's product lines, I think has allowed customers to get to know them a little bit more and develop some trust, not just with a Kawhi name, but actually a badge. Now this is something Yamaha has done a particularly good job of since the 1970s, is keeping nice, clean, consolidated branding and lines. Kawhi has been a little bit all over the map, uh, depending on the decade, but it seems that they are starting to align themselves more with that philosophy as well. So hopefully the K300 as a badge is gonna be with us for quite a few years to come. Question number three, and we get this in relation to the K300 a lot. Are Kawhi's cheaper than Yamaha's? Or more specifically, let's say is a Kawhi K300 cheaper than a Yamaha U1? So I alluded to this at the top of the video. Uh, over the last, say, 10 years, there have been major shifts in market with respect to brand share. And depending on the region, we're seeing Kawhi's and Yamaha's starting to get priced pretty well at parity. And if we use, let's say, the pianobuyerguide.com's SMP formula for people who are familiar with that particular resource, this is a uniform formula that they apply to the typical wholesale price that North American dealers usually pay, and this includes discounts which are common. So it's not just simply taking the manufacturer's wholesale price list and applying that. This is digging a little deeper. And we're now at a point where the K300 may actually be slightly more expensive for a dealer to purchase than a U1. Uh, it seems that that trend is continuing across multiple models, multiple price points, um, at least at the time of filming. So the short answer is that Kawhi's used to be cheaper, but now not necessarily. As usual, the final price you pay is gonna be up to you and your local dealer to work out, and there's always gonna be market dynamics at play, the size of the dealer, logistics costs, these are all gonna factor in. So my observations here shouldn't really be taken as anything more than pointing out a long-term trend of approaching price parity between those two models and those two brands. Next question, kind of along the same line, but which is better, the Kawhi K300 or the Yamaha U1? Well, few questions in the piano business are gonna elicit as passionate a response from all the camps as this one, at least in the upright piano realm. Um, both Kawhi and Yamaha have reams of content, online, printed, brochures, and they're full of hyperbole and very bold claims. But there are some real differences between these two pianos and a few of them I think you could objectively consider to be kind of either a better or a worse feature. Firstly, to many people who are not like totally soaked in piano lore, these two models on first glance don't seem to have a lot of daylight between them. They're both very well made, both companies have stellar reputations for after sales care, factory fit and finish, uh, they're both really thought of as right at the top of the mass produced industry. So. From what I can tell, customer satisfaction is high in both cases. But let's dig a little bit more into what I see as the differences. Firstly, the U1 does certainly use premium materials and it receives considerable factory prep. You know, you don't sit down at a U1 and have a terrible experience like ever, unless you've walked into some piano store and the U1 has been neglected, it's 40 years old, they haven't done anything to it. I mean. That's not exactly a fair comparison. Generally speaking, if you're playing a new U1 or even one that's only a few years old, it's gonna be a solid experience. And Yamaha has generally stuck to the same designs that have been present on that instrument since about the late 1990s. They've continued to update the aesthetics on the instrument and the instrument certainly has a nice crisp action and it's got a nice strong bright attack. Uh, and I've also found the sustain to be pretty good as well. It's a little less bassy and warm than what you can get out of other 48 inch uprights just due to the scale design. Uh, the bass strings on a U1 do tend to be shorter, but it's certainly not hollow, like it's not anemic. It's, it's a pretty well-rounded sound. And in a typical room in our house, 
I would you know, characterize it as a balanced tone with a slightly uh, lighter action. Now, when it comes to the K300, it offers several features which, as I said, I would argue might give it a bit of a musical advantage, but this is all, of course, up to personal preference. For one, it's got a tapered soundboard versus the non-tapered soundboard on the Yamaha. Now, this feature on its own has the potential to increase overall volume output, generally speaking, on any piano, um, and it's also going to have the potential to increase sustain. And if you execute it well, this is generally accepted as a must feature on pretty well any concert grade instrument. So as an industry, it's pretty well settled business that the best pianos have tapered soundboards. It's got a faster repetition speed and a greater accuracy when you're playing super quietly. These are measurable things. I know Kawhi has done a lot of fancy testing on the on the repetition speed, but you don't need a fancy test. Just sit down and even just try and play triple pianissimo on a K300 and go around to like any other 48 inch upright and you'll be shocked at how evenly and how consistently you're gonna hit every note. Everything's gonna sound on the K300. Uh, you do start to get into a little wobble and a, and a sense of looseness um, on most other 48 inch uprights. Yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to actually get a missed note. Now, that's not an accident. This is accomplished through a couple of design aspects from the action. They've got longer key stick length, they've got less mass and more rigidity in the repetition uh, mechanics of the action, and that microcell dampening strip on the action rest rail basically means that if you're playing at a higher velocity, so when that hammer bounces back against the rest rail, uh, that motion is muted and it's in a reset position like several milliseconds earlier than otherwise. And that doesn't sound like it's much, it actually does uh, turn into quite a bit when you're playing. Then finally, the K300 tends to have a richer tone and we already discussed that uh, when we were playing through the instrument. This is due to a slightly lower scale tension design as well as a slightly larger hammer in combination. So you do get a, a bigger bloom and you do get a little more of the, of the lower harmonics happening you know, on every note because of some of those design differences. So next on our list, is the Kawhi K300 made of plastic and is it gonna last? Well, this question was a lot more common 10 or 15 years ago, but I still hear it come up and it usually comes up uh, from a competitor I mean, it could be, you know, any competitor, and I think that this happens in many, many marketplaces uh, around the world. And I don't actually get it, because most of the time, uh, instruments that are being considered alongside a K300 are going to be good instruments with their own list of features and their own list of selling points. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me that this keeps getting dragged up as kind of a scare tactic. But here we are. Let's shed a little bit of light on this question. So first of all, Kawhi does use several composites and plastics in the manufacture of their piano actions. Um, they're actually pretty proud of it. And well, I think they kind of fell flat on their faces for a long time navigating the public relations side of that decision. Uh, to their credit, I think they've proven way beyond a doubt that this was a good and a sensible move. Uh, some have followed suit, like Mason and Hamlin, uh, others have not. Um, but for those whose suspicion you know, does get piqued by a question like this, I suspect it's a fear that the composite materials are somehow creating or affecting uh, the tone, like it's not gonna be a natural tone, or that maybe its longevity might be affected. Um, first of all, Kawhi does not use any uh, composite components, plastic or otherwise, um, in any part that actually generates the tone. So unlike, say, the Mason & Hamlin, uh, Wessel, Nickel & Gross action that went as far as replacing the hammer shank with carbon fiber, Kawhi has maintained a traditional felt and wood hammer and wood hanger shank on all of its actions. Uh, the whipping, the jack, the flange, and the damper mechanisms 
are strictly mechanical, and I don't think it could be argued that that's not the case. Uh, and that's what's been replaced with the composite materials. And what's always been interesting to think about is 150 years ago, wood was the only material you could really use to get that type of lightweight, um, high precision uh, parts manufactured. Like you couldn't cast uh, aluminum to be that specific. There was no other material that you could really use. And you found this in sports equipment, you found this in aviation, it was super common. Like wood was a lightweight, uh, easy material to work with. Well, we like moved way beyond that, but I think the association of wood and natural and natural and tone is still kind of one of those links that subconsciously persists. Ultimately, what we've seen over decades of experience with these things is that the action parts are super strong, they're really durable, they reduce the need for regulation, and they do give a faster and more consistent playing experience, particularly in low volumes. And the Kawhi K300 uses exactly the same parts and materials in its actions as Kawhi uses on the Shigeru Kawhi Grands. And those pianos have received practically near universal acclaim and respect. I'm gonna leave this question with a quote from one of the industry's most respected voices, Larry Fine. Quote, although it took a number of years to overcome the idea that composite parts must be inferior, there's essentially no dispute anymore amongst piano technicians on this subject, end quote. So to wrap up this fresh 2023 look at the K300, I'm really excited to see that Kawhi is treating this more like how Yamaha has treated the U1 in the past. It's a brand and a badge plate unto itself that has quite a bit of shelf life left and they're evolving the product as we go rather than changing the series or the model code. I think this is a really great way for customers to get to know not just the piano, uh, but the brand, and who knows, maybe this is one of the reasons why Yamaha is finding a little more competition against the U1 with the K300 than maybe they're used to with past products. Generally, when it comes to this price range, I think the K300 has the largest dynamic range of any instrument that I have ever played. I think the action is really consistent and great to play on, and I think from a student perspective, for somebody starting out on an upright with the objective of growing into a grand, I think this does a phenomenal job of equipping them with the right sense of feel and the right sense of resistance and generally a very satisfying musical experience. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the video. This has been Miriam Pianos on YouTube and if you liked what you saw or you enjoyed it, uh, please consider hitting subscribe and that notification bell so you can come back and join our ever-growing community of piano lovers and aficionados all around the world. My name is Stu Harrison. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you again soon.